dragoste sau poate și mai împăcărată pentru, pentru unul unu pentru altul. Știu că n-am vorbit de mult despre această dragoste și n-am citit și era un, un obiceiul meu, dar am observat că în rugăciunea Tatăl nostru spune că și ne arătă nouă greșeală noastre, precum și noi de greșitelor noștri. Și aș vrea că Domnul să pună în mine acest, în noi, acest har minunat. Această dragoste care să ne umple inimile de bunătate, de credincioșie, de unitate unii față de alții și aș vrea să ne însuflețească această dragoste, să îl putem lăuda pe El. E greu în perioada aceasta pentru fiecare dintre noi, că nu ne avem unii pe alții, dar să ne unim inimile noastre și să-L rugăm pe Domnul nostru să ne ajute să ne trezim și să avem o dragoste unită unii pentru alții. Următoarea cântare care o să o cântăm spune în numele Domnului Iisus, numele Do- spune despre numele Domnului Iisus și refrenul spune What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Haideți să cântăm această cântare împreună și să lăudăm pe Domnul nostru că numele Lui avem dragoste.
Să mergem mai departe cu cântarea, dar înainte aș vrea să citesc Psalmul 46, care, care e potrivit cu această cântare și care spune Dumnezeu este adăpostul și sprijinul nostru, un ajutor care nu lipsește niciodată nevoi. De aceea nu ne temem, chiar dacă s-ar zgudui pământul și dacă și s-ar clătina munții în inima mărilor. Chiar dacă ar urla și ar spumega valurile mării și s-ar ridica până acolo de să se cutremure munții, este un râu care cărui izvoare în biserică cetatea lui Dumnezeu, Sfântul Lucaș al locuințelor celui prea înalt. Dumnezeu este în mijlocul ei, ea nu se clatine. Dumnezeu o ajută în revărsatul zorilor. Neamurile se freamă de împărații se clatină, dar glasul lui răsună. Și pământul se topește de groază. Domnul oștirului este cu noi. Amin. Dumnezeul lui Iacov este un turn de scăpare pentru noi. Amin. Veniți și priviți lucrările Domnului, pustirile pe care le-a făcut El pe pământ. El a pus capăt războaielor până la marginea pământului. El a spărmat arcul și a rupt sulița 
ars cu focarele de război. Opriți-vă și să știți că eu sunt Dumnezeu. Eu stăpânesc peste neamuri, eu stăpânesc pe pământ. Domnul oștirilor este cu noi. Dumnezeul lui Iacov este un tun de scăpare pentru noi. Să nu ne temem, pentru că Dumnezeu e acela care e în control. El stăpânește peste pământ. El a creat acest univers și haideți să recunoaștem pe El ca de post al nostru și să cântăm împreună cântarea aceasta.
you are our strong refuge. Jesus, we worship you, God. We worship you because you are worthy of all praise. You are worthy, God, and we praise your name, oh God. We thank you, God, that you make a way where there is no way, Father. We thank you, God, that you are known, that you've made your name known to this people, God, to us by making streams in the desert, by making a way where there was no way, Father, by making the impossible happen because you are God. And that's what defines you. <laughs> you make a new thing. Isaiah 43, verse 19 tells us, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? it will even, I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Yes, that's our God. That's our God. He's the way maker. He's the one that makes roads where there are no roads, where no roads are possible in the eyes of man. He's the one who makes all things possible. Will you believe him today? The first song we sang, Să nu ne lași părăstiți miscând. The Lord said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So I want, I want this to be a reminder to us. If, you're, if you feel far from God, if you feel distant from him, it's not because he is keeping his distance. He's not trying to socially isolate from you. He wants to be close. But it's because you've distanced yourself from him. Come back to him. Step back towards your maker. And he will make a way in every situation, in every circumstance of your life. There's nothing that he can't do. There's nothing. But believe it. Come before him. Humble yourself as a child. Let go of your thoughts. Let go of your inhibitions. Let go of, of your beliefs otherwise. And just believe in him. Anything is possible to him that believes. That's what Jesus said. Let's worship God with this last song. This way maker. I promise you monkey, you monkey. Yes, I need present print of us. You monkey, you monkey. Yes, I need sin putting at
Ne rugăm Domnul nostru împreună, rugăciunea Tatălui nostru și să-L binecuvântăm pe El, pentru că El avem un Tată bun, avem un Rege și să ne închinăm Lui din toată inima și să-I spunem această rugăciune și să nu o facem așa, că știm pe ea bine, să fim conștienți la fiecare cuvânt care îl spunem, pentru că cuvintele acestea au fost cuvintele Domnului Iisus și El ne-a învățat să ne rugăm. De aceea, haide să, să ne... Să ne, să ne să intrăm într-o formă de închinare și să ne închinăm Domnului nostru împreună. Tatăl nostru, care ești în ceruri, sfințească-se numele Tău, fie împărăția Ta, facă-se voia Ta, precum în cer, așa și pe pământ. Pâinea noastră, cea de toate zilele, dă-ne-o nouă astăzi și ne iartă nouă greșelile noastre, precum și noi iertăm greșiților noștri, și nu ne duce pe noi în ispită, ci ne izbăvește de cer rău, că cea ta este împărăția, puterea și slava în veci. Amin. Praise Jesus! <coughs> He is good. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Really excited to be here with everybody on live stream and Flavius, of course. In a sense, this is a lot less pressure because there's like a lot fewer eyes that I can see on me, but this is cool. Um, this message will be in English. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, I asked Johnny, but uh, He can't go to everybody's house and translate. <laughs> so um, we, can, uh, we can do that in postscript, closed captions or something. So praise God. Um, I'm really excited um, about this message that God has placed on my heart. <clears throat> But before I get into the message, I just wanted to, um, to um, give you guys a f uh, one media plug that... Most of you guys know if you're on the church group or especially on the youth group. I'm sure you guys know. Many of you guys have uh, dug into this already. But um, if you haven't already checked out uh, the series called The Chosen, <clears throat> why not? <laughs> you're missing out. Um, it is incredible. Uh, so there's, it's obviously a... a, a a series about the life of Jesus. It's a series, so it's not a movie. There's eight episodes in the first season, and um, it, I think it's remarkable. Uh, I've, I'm, we're actually on our second time watching them through because um, they just give you such really good insight on, uh, on how it could have been. And I don't want every, anybody to get all tied up in a knot to say, oh, well, how do you know that this is how it was? How do you know that this is how Matthew was? How do you know that this is how Peter was? The point is otherwise. Um, the point is this. Sometimes when we read our own Bible, um, we, we come across Jesus that we don't understand in the verbiage and in the culture that uh, existed in that time. And so um, to put that on the pedestal is almost worse than, than um, just being ignorant to, to how it was in that time. Um, and so these, uh, this director who, you know, we looked into his story to see, okay, wh what is he about? Does, what does he believe, you know? And he, is, he has an amazing testimony, an amazing story. Um, <clears throat> so I highly, highly encourage you guys to, do, to check this out. They've done a lot of cultural research into how it was back then in that time. Um, and I just want to play one clip. It's five minutes. Um, And it's uh, Peter fishing. You guys all know the Bible story, but um, I think it'll give you a sense of the flow, of the dynamic, of the uh, the acting, and uh, hopefully, if you haven't watched that already, it will. These parables I tell make sense to some, not to others. Be patient. That is all for today. I have some business to attend to with my new friend.
put that down for a catch. A little farther out. Uh, I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. At your word. brother and the baptizer. <laughs> you are the Lamb of God, yes? I am. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. You don't know who I am and the things I've done. Don't be afraid, Simon. I'm sorry. We, we've waited for you for so long, we believe. But my faith, I'm sorry. <laughs> Lift up your head, fisherman. <laughs> what do you want from me? Anything you ask, I will do. Follow me. as well. Yes, you, James and John, come, follow me. I'll take the fish to the market and settle up Simon's debt. I'll get some help to fill both of these boats. Are you sure? Yes, go. What will you tell Ima? <laughs> We've just been called by the man we prayed for our entire lives. And you ask me, what will I say when you miss supper? <laughs> go, now. So, you sure you don't want to do this just a few more times? Well, we'll make a great team on the boat. Son, joking. <laughs> 
<laughs> Fish are not. Fish are not. Awesome. Can you guys see me? <clears throat> I hope so. Um, amazing. Um, I just want to check is there a delay for you guys on the stream from when I speak to when you guys hear? If there is, uh, we just have to take about 30 seconds, one minute, to uh, to restart our uh, streaming software here, um, and make sure that it works right. So just we'll. Okay, looks like we are back online. <coughs> Let us know if it's still bad, just let us know. Um, I don't know if there's going to be anything we can do at it today, but um, if not, just uh, stop watching and just listen. <laughs> anyway, hopefully the sound is good. Uh, I love that scene. I love that scene from The Chosen, and um, I think one of my favorite parts is Zebedee's line, you know, the father of James and John, and he says, and they're worried. They're saying, what, what are, what are you going to tell mom, like, about supper? We're going to miss supper. And his response is like, you've just been called by the man that we've been praying for our entire lives and you're worried about supper go like go um you know sometimes the thing that is so obvious right in front of us is is the point and and we can't even see it and we, and we miss it for smaller things and we sell our, ourselves short um it happens so often in the bible um one example i can think of is Pilate. you know he, he's questioning jesus and he you know, Jesus tells him that he's, he's come to be a witness of the truth. And Pilate says, truth? What is truth? And he's saying this as he's staring into the eyes of the only one who is truth. He's staring at truth, and he's questioning truth. It's just so, so, so many of these uh, idiosyncrasies in the Bible. Um, so anyway, I've titled this message, as you guys probably saw in the live stream, uh, Fresh Bread. Fresh Bread. Um, <clears throat> And uh, actually, we have Andrea, who is going to is going to bring us some bread here. Well, thank you. Fresh out of the oven. Look at that. Mm, beautiful. Ooh, it is hot. Thank you. Um, and let's make some space here, as you can see. Mm, this is good. I, I don't know if you guys can can get the texture of this, but just the like it's steaming, it's hot, it's, it's delicious. Wow, you know what, I'm gonna have a piece. Mm. It's good. Um, pardon? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you guys can't see the steam or smell the smell, but you'll have to believe me that it is good, it's fresh. I'm gonna do some things here that are unconventional and that I can only do because nobody else is here <laughs> and because I'm gonna vacuum after. <laughs> But um, anyway, so we're all in quarantine, and the truth of the matter is that in quarantine, we are probably, if anything, eating too much bread. <laughs> we all have a lot of time on our hands, um, and, you know, it's, it's very easy to, to eat and eat bread and, and eat a lot. But even though a lot of us are getting physical food, physical bread during this quarantine, I feel like a lot of us aren't getting enough spiritual bread. And that's what I want this message to be about. And it's not to do specific with quarantine, but it certainly helps to emphasize that because we're in this state, um, we need to focus on getting our spiritual bread. So, um, first of all, I want to give you guys a short Hebrew lesson on bread. Um, does anybody know the Hebrew word for bread? If you do, you can... Uh, Put it on the YouTube chat or the group or something. Let's test. No Googling. <laughs> okay. The Hebrew word for bread is lehem. That's, that's what's pronounced. Oh, it's pronounced lehem. That's a little in your throat. That's, you know, Hebrew. Um, lehem is the word for bread. Everybody say it with me wherever you are. Lehem. 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 Lehem is bread. And this word is used uh, a lot in the Bible, as you can understand, Old Testament Hebrew. Uh, we're going to go through some examples here of lehem. 
of bread. Psalm 37, verse 25, says this. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging for lechem. I love that verse. That's a good one. I've been young, and now I'm old. I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging for bread. Amen. Lehem. Psalm 132, verse 15. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with lehem. It's God speaking to his people. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with lehem, with bread. And one more important one, which I'm going to use to springboard off into my message. Exodus 16, verse 3 and 4. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate lechem to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain lechem from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So, let's talk a little bit about this lechem, this bread, this stuff that came from heaven that God sent to the Israelites in the desert. Um, first of all, uh, do, do you know what the meaning of manna is? What, is, what does manna mean? Good call. Quail? No, no, no. Quail is different. Um, the meaning of, of manna has been recently, well, not recently, but over time interpreted to mean bread because that's what they call the stuff that God gave them and it was kind of like bread. But the meaning of manna doesn't actually mean bread. It actually means, what is it? The word manna means, what is it? So they would go out and say, what? What? What, is, what is this? What is it? Oh, there's some stuff on the ground. What is it? Perfect. Let's call it what is it. Hmm, this what is it's pretty good. That's what manna means. It's like, um, funny you should mention Google. It's, like, it's just like the word Google. The word Google, when you say now, what does everybody think of? The search engine, the website, right? Oh, let's Google it. Yeah, I went on Google and I found this. Everybody in the whole world, in our generation, knows what Google means. But the word Google doesn't mean that. The word Google is actually a number. Um, it's a one with a hundred zeros behind it. But see how over time that word is transformed to mean search something up or research something, right? Um, same thing with manna. It means what is it. But, you know, over time it's grown to be implicitly known as bread. So, um, the same way that manna ended up being interpreted as bread, it literally means, what is it? So they collected, what is it, every day, and they made food. Now, the rules around this manna, this what is it, uh, were also strange. You could only collect enough for what you needed that day. Um, if you collected too much because you were worried about tomorrow, then it would rot. You had to only collect for that day. Except, of course, on the day before the Sabbath. Then you could collect for two days for your entire family, and that portion would not rot because of God's special blessing. So there was so much mysticism and, and interesting things about this manna. And th this didn't just happen for one week to say, oh, wow, look at this cycle. Like, if I, if I collect too much, if I collect, here, let me, this is what I was going to do. So, forgive me, cleaning people. You see bread on the ground. Obviously, it doesn't look like bread. They didn't know what it was like. Um, but it was manna on the ground. And they would have to collect it, right? And so they would say, all right, today I got to collect one, two, three, four, five pieces. But you know what? Oh, I don't know if I'm going to have enough for tomorrow. Like, you know, what if, what if we run out? What if, what if this manna doesn't show up tomorrow? We're literally relying on a God that sends us this what is it stuff every morning. Let me just take a bit extra. And I take four more pieces. And I would put this in my pots there in my tent. And guess what? I would eat this stuff this day. Tomorrow, this would be moldy, full of worms. That's what the Bible said. Except on the day before the Sabbath, 
When you collect it double so that you wouldn't have to work on the Sabbath, it would be fine. What is that? That's like a miracle every single seven days, isn't it? Like, it's, it's amazing. Um, so the rules around it were interesting. They weren't something that could be really understood logically. They were just do this. And why did God do this? I want to put that last verse from Exodus 4 up again. It is amazing. Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day. Why? That I may test them. Test them in what? Whether they will walk in my law or not. What does that mean? Whether they will walk in my law. Remember, the law hadn't even been, been given then, at this point, when he first gave the manna. Um, so he's saying, whether they will walk in my law, whether they will, in other words, obey me. That's right. Whether they will obey me. I want to see whether they will obey me. Because if you go into your garden and collect some carrots, some onion, and, uh, you know, get a chicken and cut it, and, and, and you have all these ingredients that you know because your mother taught you to make a soup, there's no obedience required for that action. That's just something that you, because of your tradition, how you've been raised, what you've been taught, you do it. It takes no act of faith to do that. But in order to trust God that tomorrow's provision will also be there, that takes faith. In order to trust God to not overcollect, in order to trust God, this is another thing that they did and they blew it on, to not go out on Sabbath morning to look for manna because you know God already told you wouldn't be there, that takes faith. So it's always an act of faith that is required for, for God to see whether we are actually obeying him or not. God sustained them like this for 40 years with something that they did not understand to test them, to prove to them again and again, every single day, every single week, that he would be faithful to them. Um, so the point was not their sustenance. That was just a byproduct. It needed to be sustained. But the point was for God to see whether they would be obedient to him. That's what matters. Um, oftentimes, I'll go for a walk with my kids, especially during this quarantine. So, for example, uh, we'll take uh, Ezra and Abby. They they're both go on their own devices, Abby on her scooter and uh, Ezra on his bike now. And we'll go. And uh, one thing that... Uh, see, Ezra is the kind of boy, if you guys know him at all, he, he thrives on uh, rules. Hi, Ezra. I'm sure he's watching now. Uh, <clears throat> I love all my kids so much. And um, he thrives on rules. He, you know, you give him a framework to operate within, and he, he will, man, he knows. He'll tell other people not to do it. He'll operate within those rules. He'll learn how to, uh, uh, how do I say this, to benefit the most within the framework of those rules without breaking the rules, you know. Um, and then when he sees somebody else breaking the rules, it's like, a big, big no-no for him, right? Um, Abby is a little bit different personality. She uh, doesn't really, she believes the rules are flexible and they don't always apply. Um, she just won't listen. Um, I'm sure none of you guys have kids like that. <laughs> um, so anyway, so when we're going for a walk, uh, one of the things that of course I watch out for if I'm going slower with, you know, Hannah in a cart or something is how far away she is. Um, and of course, any dangers around. If they're on the sidewalk, do I see any garages open? Do I see any cars that are on that it might back out or something? And so I'll tell her, Abby, stop. And of course, many times she won't stop. She'll just keep on going. Or she'll stop for a second, and then she'll go again. And so sometimes I have to discipline her. So I'll call her back to me, and I'll say, Why did I have to take your stroller away? And then... Um, she would usually say something like, because I went too far. I went too far from you. And I'd say, no, that's not why you're being punished. And they'd say, tati, tati. because you didn't listen. That is the point. Because you see, if, let's say we made a rule and we said, okay, and we have some of these rules, to say, okay, don't go past this uh, blue house go farther than that, but don't go past that blue house. And now let's say that she, you know, she's a little bit more uh, traditional or religious or whatever, and she starts taking down those rules in her little rule book, okay? Thou shall not cross the blue house until dad gets there. You know, and she makes all these rules. And would that be the point, though? 
Because one day, I may say, okay, Abby, you can go all the way to the red house. I see no danger anywhere. You can go. But another day, you might get one house by, and it says, stop right now. Stop right now. And she might say, no, no, but dad, the rule says, the rule says I can go all the way to the blue house. No. Stop right now. Because there's a car backing out, or there's a car coming in that's about to go into that driveway. Stop right now. What's the point? Is the point for, for her to obey a set of rules, or for her to obey her parents to obey that is the point and that's what God wants to teach us as well listening is key it is absolutely key um, that's why first Samuel 15 verse 22 says to obey is better than sacrifice to obey is better than sacrifice We need fresh bread from God. We need a fresh word from him every day. Because what he tells us today um, might be different than what he told us yesterday. Now, I don't have time, and the purpose of the sermon is not to go into um, God contradicting his word. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about him um, contradicting what he is, uh, you know, his his moral laws to us and those things like that. But what I'm saying is that we have personal situations, every single one of us, where one day God may say, stop, just wait. And when you get fresh bread from him, the next time you say, okay, now it's time. Now go. I'm talking about things about purpose for your life. I'm talking about direction for what God has for you. That's why it's important that we get fresh lechem from him every single day. We should be seeking it every single day because he sustains us. I don't have the verse here, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's exactly Jesus' first temptation when the devil said, turn this uh, stone into bread. And he said, no, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Another thing is, don't rely on yesterday's lehem, because chances are it's rotten. <laughs> if you rely on yesterday's lehem because you say, oh, I, I don't need to spend time uh, with God today. I don't need to, to get fresh bread from God today because, you know what, I, I spent double time yesterday or I, I have enough from yesterday. That's not how it works. You need fresh bread from him every single day. And on Sabbath, well, you're at church, so you're getting bread, hopefully. <laughs> um, the analogy only goes so far. But, um, yeah. So, uh, you're going to get yourself into trouble by living off of yesterday's manna. Let me say it again. You're going to get yourself into trouble if you're trying to live off of yesterday's lehem. Let's say you're a new Christian, and you're reading your Bible for the first time. And you're going through, and you're saying, okay, I have a question. How does God provide food for people who are hungry? Like, what, how does he work in that way? What is the mechanism by which he does that? Like, I want to learn to understand how God does that. And so you're reading through the Bible, and I'm sure I don't have all the instances where God provided food, but a few of them here. Uh, So you read this story with the Israelites in the desert, and then you read that he gave them manna, this what is it stuff, on the ground that they collected every day. And then you say, oh, okay, let me write that down. So this is how God provides food for hungry people. He, he gives them this stuff on the ground every morning that they go out and collect, and collect, and here are the rules that you need. Pick up only what you need, etc., etc. Got it. Okay, check. I know at least that much about God. But you continue reading in your Bible, and you get to... Um, you get to the part where uh, Elijah, there's a famine in the land, and God tells him to go by a ravine to drink the water, and then what does God do? As a new Bible reader, you might expect to say, ah, okay, here's another uh, food situation, food shortage. I bet you God is going to bring more manna on the ground. No. What does he do? He sends ravens. He sends birds of the air to come and bring him food with their beaks. Like just bits of food. Okay, that's a bit odd. Okay, let me write that down as a next way that God can feed people who are hungry. Okay, and you keep on going. And you get to the widow who was on her last bit of oil and flour. I said, oh, is it going to be manna or is it going to be ravens now? No, guess what it is now? It's endless supply. The jar never empties. She keeps on pouring out the flour, the oil. It never is empty. It just keeps on coming back every day. God, this is strange. Like, why, what's with all these inconsistencies? God, like, why, why can't you do something the same way? (laughs) 
And then you get to, uh, you know, let's fast forward to the New Testament. There's 5,000 men and all their families. It's late in the day. They're hungry. They need food. Okay, God, is it going to be manna? That might be easier. There's a lot of people here. Uh, is it going to be ravens to bring all this food? Is it going to be endless supply? No, guess what? Now it's multiplication. Now you have fish and bread, and he multiplies it, and then there's leftover. So you're reading about this, and, and then you read about the early church and how they fed their hungry. How? It wasn't by any visible miracle but it was by all of them sharing their resources. And nobody had, every, everybody had everything in common. And so you're like, God, I don't get it. How do you work? First the manna, then the ravens, then endless supply, multiplication. I can't figure it out. How will you do it next time? Remember what the children of Israel called the stuff on the ground? Manna? What is it? Exactly. How is God going to do it next time? No idea. And neither do you. You have no idea. And it's not even your business. I read it earlier during worship, Isaiah 43, verse 19. Behold, I will do what? A new thing. A new thing. He is, he thrives on doing new things. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God loves doing new things. And I'll tell you one reason why. I don't know all the reasons, but I know one because he said in Deuteronomy. Why does he like to do new things? To test you. To test whether you'll listen. I can guarantee you after 40 years, they knew how to collect manna and the rules and when to collect how much and whatnot, like the back of their hand. Because now it's been absorbed into their common sense. Yeah, man, okay, six day, gather, double, you know, all that stuff. But he has to do a new thing to test whether you will listen. Otherwise, it'll just be an exercise of your routine, of your discipline, of what you already know. A new thing is what forces us to be connected with God. It's why we need fresh bread from him every single day. It's why we need to be connected to him. It's why we need his lamb every day. Amen. Oh. Lost my train of thought here. So, let me ask, what does God want from you? Does he want you to obey the rules or to obey him? Sometimes they're the same thing. Sometimes the rules are exactly what he's calling you to do. And it's the reason why we have the Bible. It's the reason why we read it and study it. But there's also a very important reason why we pray and have fellowship with him so that we can get fresh bread and obey him in every day. So I ask you, what challenges are you facing where you need God's input today? Maybe you need answer to prayer. Maybe during this difficult time you need a financial breakthrough or a marriage breakthrough or, or breakthrough with your children, a relationship. Maybe it's healing that you need. Don't give up on coming to God every day. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. What, what I am responsible, and this message is so much for me just as it is for all of us, is today to come to God to get bread. Today to come to God to get my lehem. It's not wrong to ask him. And we're going to read this in a little bit, and Janini prayed it right at the end. The Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. It is not wrong. God tells us, Jesus instructed us to ask for him of bread. Bread means physical things. It means uh, financial things. It means everyday things. It means family things. It means school things. It means study things. It means healing things. It means all those things. But it also means just a fresh revelation from him as well. Don't, it's not wrong to come to God with, with your everyday needs. In fact, I would question your relationship, God, if you didn't. If you thought that God was too big or mighty or high to care about your life. That's not true. So we're told to come to him. We're told to ask, to seek, and to knock. Um, we have to know this, guys. We have to know that we are his treasure. He wants to give us healing. He wants to give us breakthrough. He wants to give us freedom. But his main desire is to commune with you every day. He wants you to come and eat of his bread every day. Nehem. 
collect your lechem every day. Matthew 6, verse 11, Lord's Prayer. I want to spend a little bit of time on this here. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day, I want you to read the sentence as if you were in English class. Where's my water? Give us this day our daily bread. Is there something wrong with that? Give us this day our daily bread. Um, from a grammatical standpoint, this is incorrect. I, I don't want to point this out to Jesus. Maybe he didn't do too good in English or Hebrew or whatever. I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> but if you type this into Word, Microsoft Word, you'd probably get a grammar error and say this is redundant. You're using give us this day our daily bread. It should be either give us this day our bread, which makes sense, or give us our daily bread. Did Jesus make a mistake? No. Thank you. No, absolutely not. He's making a point. He's being emphatic about this. This day, give us this day our daily bread. And here's why. Because he knew most of us would resist this. Say, really? But this is too much work. I don't want to pray for why daily bread. Like, I would rather pray, God, just give me this year my yearly bread, and I'll be good. Just give me, you know, just, just give me what I need for a year, and I'll be good. And I'll come back next Christmas at church, you know, and get my next bread. Give me this year what I need. Give me this week what I need. But he didn't do that. He said, give us this day our daily bread. God desires daily fellowship with you. He desires daily fellowship. Daily Every single day. My first thoughts when I was working on this message, um, you know, all the symbolism and the bread and all that, I thought, um, oh, you know what? I should save this for like a communion message because this, this would be, you know, so symbolic and here it is. We have the bread. We have the wine. And, and then I, I almost felt, I thought I felt the Holy Spirit impress on me. You know what? This is good that this didn't land on China. Because if you're relying to get a connection with God once a month, you're in big trouble. <laughs> and maybe explains a lot of the situation that you're in right now. Because God wants you to get bread daily, today, on communion days and on all the 30 other days where you don't have that. Every single day you must get bread from him. The disciples had communion every day. Not that it matters that you physically eat a piece of bread, but you have to get daily lechem from him every single day. So have you received your daily lechem from God? Or are you trying to live off of bread from yesterday? Or are you trying to live off of physical bread alone and eating too much? <laughs> That's another question. This quarantine is challenging spiritually. It is. I, I miss church, and church is not a building. I miss seeing everybody's faces. I'm, I'm glad to see even a few of you guys here. Um, but I miss seeing everybody. I miss speaking to you where we can fellowship and interact. I, I miss worshiping with everybody, praying with everybody. Fellowship is biblical. It is of God, and it's a blessing. And it makes sense that during this time, we would sense um, that lack of fellowship. But... If you're not getting your daily bread from God, it may be indicative of a deeper issue that's only surfacing now. Regardless of whether we can have fellowship or not outside of our own families, which we should still be doing, you have to be getting bread from God. If you're relying on getting it from a sermon um, once a week, if you're not spending time to get lechem from God, you will have issues. This is the call of a Christian life is to be fully dependent on God. So, um, one more thing, one more point before I, I start coming to a close here. <clears throat> okay. Um, I want to teach you one other Hebrew word here. It's real easy. Okay? It's not as hard as lechem. Um, anyway, one more, one more Hebrew word, and uh, that is the word 
for house. Word for house in Hebrew is Beth. Yeah, Beth means house. So um, take the name of our church, Bethany, Bethania, right? That means Beth Ani. It means a house of figs or house of dates. House of dates. So if you're single and you want to mingle, start coming to our church. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> house of dates is in like the eating dates, right? Um, <clears throat> or Bethsaida. Bethsaida means house of the hunt or house of fishing. Uh, Bethel. Beth. El, El means God, so house of God, Bethel. Um, and I absolutely love, it floors me, I love the way that God weaves his themes in the tapestry of the Bible and leaves his fingerprint through all these subtle connections. He leaves it so that the Holy Spirit can give us ears to hear and eyes to see these connections and know that our Father is speaking something to us. Very important. Ready? In approximately 6, in the year 6 BC, Quirinius, governor of Syria, ordered a census. Joseph and his pregnant wife were forced to leave his hometown, <clears throat> sorry, and go to his hometown to register. What was that hometown? Pardon? No, he had to go to his hometown to register. Bethlehem, that's right, Bethlehem. Bethlehem is where there was no room for them to stay, as you guys know. Bethlehem is where Mary went into labor. Bethlehem is where Jesus was born. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. It means house of bread. That's what Bethlehem means. And if that's not enough, do you remember what Jesus was laid in after he was born? What was he laid in? Away in a, a manger. Do you know what a manger is? It's, it, it's a place where animals eat from. Eat, food. Jesus was put in a place was eaten from a dish. <sighs> wow. And here's the, here's the passage that brings it all together. John 6, 31. This is a Jesus talking to this uh, group of uh, Jews here. And he says, Our ancestors ate the manna, the what is it, in the wilderness, at, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Verse 32. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread, the lechem from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, Sir, always give us this bread. Give us this bread from now on. And then Jesus said in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The bread from heaven is no longer a mystery. It's no longer called, what is it? The bread from heaven. Now it has an official name, or rather he has a name. And his name is Jesus, praise God. He was born in the town of Bethlehem, which means house of bread, and was laid right in a place to eat from. Look at the symbology here. I don't know how this can get more clear. Jesus said it himself in John 6, verse 53. He says, unless you eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. Unless you eat of God's bread every single day, unless you spend time with Jesus, who is the bread of God, every single day, you won't have life in you. Do you want life? Do you want to never thirst again? It's not a rhetorical question. Just like, just like um, and if you watch the whole episode, you'll, you'll see kind of the backstory behind it. Just like Jesus called Peter, and Peter had to let go of everything. He'd drop his business, drop his, uh, a lot of his hopes, his aspirations, and say, you know what? I'm going to die to my life to follow you. I'm not saying this is going to be easy, but do you want life? Are you that desperate to drink of water 
that after which you will no longer be thirsty again? Are you that desperate to eat of bread that after you eat of, you will no longer be hungry again? This is not my words. This is, this is the Bible, guys. This is John 6. Study it this week. Let's, let's talk about what that looks like. Anytime we're nervous about something, anytime we have a life situation where we're not sure about something, guess what? We're thirsty. We're thirsty. That's what this means. Um, we have a void that needs to be quenched. That's what that means. And the bread from heaven promises to never leave us hungry again. When you're not able to rest, when you're stressed, when you're panicked about life, when you're, you're hungry, that's, that's what your soul is saying. I'm hungry. I, I, I have a void. I, I'm worried about this thing. You have a need that, that has to be filled, and you haven't gotten your daily dose of lehem from God. When you can't stop yelling at your kids, especially during this quarantine, or your spouse, and frustration, and you don't know why you can't let go of grudges, your soul is simply hungry for God's bread, which would fill you and give you the patience and the forgiveness that is supernatural. It's not hard, guys. It just takes, it takes abandonment to him and getting bread from him every day. So, Here's my final advice. Eat bread. Eat bread. The bread of heaven. Commune with Jesus every day. Eat it every single day. When your kids annoy you the next time, for the seventh time this minute, you'll have a smile on your face and on the inside, and you'll say, you still got seven times, 70 more to go. When natural thoughts regarding how you're going to make next month's rent creep in, you'll be able to lift up holy hands and say, Jehovah Jireh, you are my provider and thank you for your peace. And you will have eaten that bread that gives you peace above and beyond these natural circumstances. We often read about the fruits of the Spirit and we think that's only for pastors and for the spiritual people. No. It's, it's for people that eat the bread of God every day. You eat and you won't be hungry anymore. You drink and you won't be thirsty. You wonder how you will ever get love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all those things which seem insurmountable now, you eat. You eat his bread. Go into your room today. Close the door. When you're doing your morning devotionals, just do me a favor. Turn off Instagram. Nobody cares how you drink your coffee during your morning devos. Just get alone with Jesus. Just get alone with him. Get alone and, and, and seek his bread. Eat from him. Eat from the communion with him. Calm your mind. Speak your mind to him. And listen. Listen for what he tells you. Listen for this bread, which he has to give you fresh every single morning. And the most important thing, the last thing I'll say, the most important thing, do it again tomorrow. Do it again tomorrow and the next day. Amen. May God help us in this. Um, I don't want to just close with a prayer and, um, and bless you guys watching online. God, I thank you so much for your bread. Thank you so much for your bread which comes down from heaven. Thank you, God, that you have, what was once a mystery, you have made so clear to us, Lord. And we don't have time to expound it in a 40-minute in a sermon. But Lord, I, I just, I hope that through your spirit, God, through your Holy Spirit in every single heart, that you have spurred this interest to, to look into, man, I need bread. I need your bread. I need, I need to partake with you, Jesus, every single day. I can't go on a day without you. And Lord, may it no longer surprise us in our days where we falter or don't have a great day why that happened. It's simply because we did not get fresh bread from you that day, God. Help us, Lord, to have communion with you. Help us, Lord, to be one with you, to be close with you, Lord, and to not live off of yesterday's bread, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. Bless us this day. Bless us, Lord, to, to help us to start new habits, Lord, that to happen every single day, Lord. Um, I pray that you bless every family where they are, that you would bless their fellowship and their uh, the food that they're going to eat, Lord, and, and help us, Lord, to truly be um, your disciples, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God.